recovery from recent health difficulties. Mrs McLaughlin. Well wishes and again just to place on record to thank the committee, uh, the chair of the committee who was in contact with me when I took sick and obviously to thank Carl Nicullen who stood in my place uh, very quickly in a challenging time and indeed all of the members in the house for the well wishes um, for my health and I'm back in again so glad to be engaging with everyone. Um, so just in terms of the question um, by the member and thank you for it. Obviously, uh, Minister Nicollin, when she was in post, recently announced the extension of the 2016-19 Child Poverty Strategy to May 2022. The purpose of this strategy is to ensure that works collectively to tackle the issues faced by children and families impacted by poverty. This extension will allow time for further engagement with the Anti-Poverty Strategy Expert Panel and co-design group on how to address uh, child poverty in the longer term and obviously these panels um, and groups have just been established uh, over recent months. They will consider whether measures uh, to deal with child poverty within the overarching anti-poverty strategy currently in development is the right approach or whether standalone child poverty strategy is required. Also a review of the people in place, a strategy for neighbourhood renewal is currently ongoing involving a co-design approach with the key stakeholders involved. And it is expected that the review will be completed within the current Assembly mandate and findings from that review uh, will inform the development of the anti-poverty strategy. As work progresses, obviously, on this strategy, there will be a number of opportunities, uh, particularly for young people, to engage with the development of the process. And obviously, I will be engaging with the Children's Commissioner and those other stakeholders that give young people um, a voice. And it is planned that the anti-poverty strategy will be published this December, subject to executive approval. Thank you. Mrs McLaughlin. Thank you, Minister, for your response. And as, I, as you would be aware, organisations that uh, work to support families in poverty, and many of which have at least one parent that is working, are clear that the benefit cap is a significant factor in child poverty. So will the Minister ensure that mitigations um, are provided for the benefit cap. Well, obviously, the member will be aware in terms of the budget um, announcement yesterday in terms of uh, mitigation protections um, around existing mitigations have been included um, in the budget going forward. I do have a commitment, obviously, to bring forward that paper on mitigation in the coming weeks to the executive. And I'm also currently carrying out a review um, with officials in the department and importantly engaging with those critical stakeholders um, that impact on areas around poverty um, to look at what further mitigations and protections we can bring in. So, of course, yes, that issue is part of that ongoing work. And again, I'll inform the committee in this chamber um, as we're taking all of that forward. This is Karen Mullen. Good pre last, Karen Kohler, and can I also join with members welcoming the Minister back? It's great to have you back. Um, uh, Minister, in your answer to the member, you outlined your plan to engage with the Children's Commissioner and all our stakeholders. Could you outline and give maybe a wee bit of detail how you, you plan to include young people um, in the development of the anti-poverty strategy? Yeah, well, I think this is a, a critical role to hear the voices of those that are directly impacted by the policy so that I want to take forward and indeed the executive and assembly want to take forward as a whole. I had an engagement uh, with the uh, NI Youth Forum just last week, um, looking at these issues and even across, I suppose, the remit of my department. I want to look at all of these strategies and a co-design with those stakeholders um, that the policies impact and that the strategies impact. And obviously, the design, co-design panels and expert panels that have been designed are starting to look at that. We're having an ongoing engagement with those organisations um, that work in and around the, the wider policy issues around poverty, but indeed with children and young people as well. Obviously, I want to directly hear the voices um, of children and young people um, and how the, any future policy will impact on them, and I want them to be involved in that co-design process. So again, we're looking at ways in the midst of a pandemic that we can do that um, and to hear their voices and obviously to work importantly with the organisations that support them directly, such as the NI Youth Forum, 
but other localised uh, forums and organisations as well. Thank you. Before I call Mr John Blair to ask question two, just a bit of housekeeping members. Question number eight has been withdrawn and topical question nine has been withdrawn. Mr John Blair. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thanks very much. Um, the independent reviewer, Marie Kavanagh, provided my department with a copy of her final report on the 11th of December 2020. And I want to take this opportunity to place on record my thanks um, to Marie for her report, which was extremely comprehensive, and for completing the review despite the unprecedented challenges that were arising as a result of this pandemic. I acknowledge the important contribution made by the review um, of people and organisations and recognise that the findings are important in continuing to improve the PIP process and to ensure that it is delivered with compassion and in an empathetic manner. My officials are currently considering the recommendations within the full report and in line with the approach adopted for the first independent uh, review, my department will publish a formal response in the spring um, of this year. So in the coming months, uh, we will have a, a response published in terms of taking that forward. Mr Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for, for that reply and echo your sentiment that it's good to see her back here. Uh, can I ask further to, to, to the question, Principal Deputy Speaker, if the Minister can do all that she can to ensure that the future provision of PIP assessments will concentrate on helping people to live independently rather than making them prove their disability? I think, obviously, I mean, it's an important question, and obviously, um, Marie Kavanagh has come forward with 12 recommendations and areas in terms of the review. Obviously, we have engaged over 250 responses in terms of the impact of the PIP. So, in terms of looking at uh, disability and assessor training around that, and obviously, I suppose, given the, the um, independence um, and empowering those with disabilities to engage, then that's something that I want to con seriously consider. And obviously, when my officials come back in terms of their assessment of the recommendations, I'll be picking up these issues in the time ahead, um, and that report will be published uh, by spring. Mr. Mark Durkham. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answers thus far, and welcome her return to the Assembly and the Executive. Ms. Kavanagh recommends that PIP assessments be brought in house, given the well publicised negative experience of claimants at the hands of Capita. Yet the Minister has confirmed to me in a written answer to me that the contract with Capita that was due to end in July may be extended for another two years. The problems with Capita long predate the pandemic. So can the Minister tell us, is she content to reward Capita with more public money for their failure? Well, obviously, when I come into the department, I mean, this was one of the areas that I am acutely aware of in terms of the impacts of these assessments, concerns that have been raised by those who go through the assessments, and obviously the, the independent advice sector in terms of the experience of people as well. And as I said before, I want to create a social security system which works with people, which empowers the citizens themselves, and which is empathetic in terms of their needs. There are restrictions at the moment. I can't just change a complete system right away. You'll understand that a lot of the processes, the IT infrastructure, are not just pertaining to here. They work right across England, Scotland and Wales in looking at some of this. But I have instructed officials to look at a reworked in-house model. I know, obviously, that this has been picked up in terms of the recommendations as well. Um, and when I'm reviewing the recommendations from officials from this uh, reassessment of the PIP process, that is one of the critical areas that I will look at in more detail. So we can't change it right away because you can't just change something like that in a matter of months. Um, but I am instructing officials to look at what we need to do that in the time ahead that we are looking at that in-house model, but more importantly, a model that meets the needs of the people who require it and engagement with those individuals and with the advice sector in the design and what that will look like will be critical in the time ahead. And there's a commitment from me to look at all and to do that. Ms Gemma Dolan. Freelas Concordia and I too want to welcome the Minister back um, to the Executive. Um, Minister, does the Department plan to ensure all communications issued to disabled people meet their requirements? These are obviously one of the issues and I mean we're considering uh, the comments that has been made by Marie in terms of the um, 
the assessment that she has done. Um, it's one of the areas that we're looking at in terms of disability and the requirements there. And I will be bringing forward, obviously, an assessment of that and what the next steps are uh, once we bring uh, the publication of this um, and my department's commitments in springtime. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and just want to welcome the Minister back. And uh, it's good to see you in such good health. And um, thank your your standing deputy; she was more than capable of doing the job, uh, Carol McKillen. So, uh, Minister, uh, you will note that the review recommendations on special rules for terminal illness, illness have been mentioned, which comes further to the first review and the cross-party support for scrapping of the special rule. Therefore, uh, Minister, can you provide an update on the department's work in this respect? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and it's an important question. And obviously, you will be aware that uh, Carl, when she was in this role on a temporary basis, had signalled a commitment to reform the terminal illness uh, rules during the debate that took place at that time. Obviously, this has been raised at uh, the executive. Um, I think there is broad support um, in that it needs to change and that that needs to be done urgently. Treasury has raised areas of clarification, obviously, in our attempts to move to make changes. Officials are working with Treasury at the moment to get the clarification sorted as soon as possible, and then for a paper to be brought back to the executive to make those changes and approval. So I will update members, um, certainly of the committee and indeed the chamber, once we're at a point of doing that. But I do want to expedite this as quickly as possible. Mr. Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker and Minister. That will be question number three. Thank you. Thanks very much for your question. Obviously, preparations are underway for the reopening of museums, both by National Museums and the Museums Council. Um, and building on the processes developed obviously last year. This includes updating risk assessments to comply with the latest COVID guidance, working collaboratively with other body, bodies to redesign. Um, exhibitions and the visitor experience, and also undertaking promotional activity in advance of reopening. I know that our museums are very much looking forward, obviously, to welcoming visitors back and to ensure that they do that uh, in a safe manner. Mr. Harvey. First of all, it's um, good to see you back again, Minister, and I too do wish you well. A supplementary, Minister, would be would you consider progressing a pro Proposed development of a much needed historic motor exhibition centre in the Forest Park and Yuri Morn and Down Council area, with the hope of increasing footfall and serving the classic motoring fraternity. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm not aware of any request uh, pertaining to that exhibition coming into the department at the moment, but certainly if the member in the local council area wants to write to me. Um, then we can arrange a meeting uh, to look at the issues, uh, to look at the request, and then to see how we can take it forward. Spot the classic car enthusiast. Mr. Pat Shane. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, and thanks to the Minister for answers thus far. Uh, and welcome back. Um, could the Minister tell us what financial support has been given to museums during this COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, the National Museums obviously have received um, an additional $1.22 million in resources uh, from the Department. Obviously, working with uh, the NI Museums Council and collaborating with the Art Fund, uh, we have been looking at uh, a programme to support 14 museums to reopen and to work in a safe environment. And obviously, the outline value of that work so far has been £11,000. Also, the NI Museums Council um, has also collaborated with the Arts Council with the organisation's emergency fund um, for local museums to the value so far of £50,000. So obviously in the midst of the pandemic, the impact that this has had, looking at uh, these organisations and sustainability going forward, I am keeping these measures and any supports that we can introduce under constant review and obviously liaison with um, colleagues in the executive around uh, budgetary um, issues or commitments. And I'll update members um, as they progress. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I too would add my welcome back. Um, my, my Minister, my constituency colleague, it's great to have you back and, 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 um, and to have you at the, the dispatch box. Um, 
can I ask specifically uh, in relation to um, arts venues, galleries? I think currently they are categorised uh, as the same as uh, wet pubs in terms of the plan for safe reopening, while I and lots of others would be very much like to get back to a wet pub as well as a, a, an art gallery. Is, there, is it worth looking at whether they belong in exactly the same category in terms of safe reopening, and is that something your department is looking at? Well, we're obviously keeping the regulations under constant review, and obviously that's in line with seeking the health advice in terms of what's safe to do so. We obviously want to engage with um, the sector themselves, and obviously we do have an ongoing engagement with fish officials. If there is an issue, I mean, I'm not aware of any issues in terms of saying they're being compared. Obviously, we're looking at all of these um, in the context of health and safety. Um, but if there is an issue that is arisen there, I mean, I'm happy to look at it, um, and I'll take it away just from your question today, um, just in terms of looking at an answer. But the staff are continuing to engage with the sector. Um, obviously, we want to get things reopened as quickly as possible, but obviously when it's safe to do so. Um, I know the executive will be looking at issues in the coming days um, around the current regulations and where things sit. Um, and obviously that will be dependent on what um, the health minister will be bringing forward. So these are under constant review at the moment. Um, we will uh, be engaging with the sector in how we can do that safely around reopening. And again, we'll update members. But on the specific issue, uh, Matthew, I'll come back to you just in a bit more detail in terms of what the sector are raising. Mr. Andrew Muir. Very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I would join with others in welcoming the Minister back to her post. Uh, a number of years ago, I was fortunate enough to get a tour behind the scenes of the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, and was amazed to see the amount of items are in storage. What percentage of items are in storage, and what plans are there to bring more items out on display? I'm not aware of the figures around percentages right now, but I can um, get that to you. But obviously. We do engage with museums and even around the pandemic, I suppose just feeding into the initial question. We obviously are, are working with our museums partners um, around trying to get as much of the exhibitions into the public sphere as possible um, and where that can be rotated to ensure that as much of them, I mean, the worst thing you can do is just to keep them in storage where the members of the public don't see it. Um, so obviously there is an ongoing programme. It's even learning around how we can virtually put things online. And I know as a result of the pandemic where people haven't been able to visit um, these spaces, that we're trying to look at ways of improving and doing more of that, um, that there can be that online. Ex and also looking at possibilities that when things do open up again, can some of these exhibitions actually go out beyond the museum and the building itself? So we're continuing to keep this under uh, review. If you're looking at specifics around a programme in terms of the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, then happy to give you that detail um, after this session as well. And now for an encore, Mr. Andrew Muir. Number four, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thanks for your question. I suppose the Job Start scheme uh, was planned and due to launch on the 14th of December. The Department has had to unfortunately pause this scheme as clarification is needed in terms of funding approval for the scheme going into this new financial year. Um, I am continuing to keep the situation under review and obviously uh, will, advise, will advise as developments. There's also been limitations obviously with the current regulations um, in terms of encouraging people to stay at home. We have had engagements uh, with employers, with key stakeholders around obviously the devisement of this scheme. Um, and I do want to get the job uh, start scheme uh, kicked off as soon as possibly can. Obviously, the budget has been announced yesterday. We can see the pressures um, that are presented around the budget, um, and I'm continuing to engage with finance and with other executive colleagues, and obviously um, looking at the labour market and what interventions we can do, and particularly this scheme, um, I want to commit to getting this up and running as soon as possible. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, I questioned about this on the 8th of September after the scheme was launched uh, across the water uh, on the 8th of July called Kickstart. I was told that it would launch in November, and now we're being put off yet again. It seems to be more rather than job start, it's more like non start. C can the Minister outline to me what funding was bid for and has any money been returned to the centre as a result of these delays in terms of launching this very much wanted scheme? Well, we are trying to launch the scheme within this financial year, so as of yet, no, there's been no money uh, returned to the centre in terms of this scheme um, at the moment. 
Obviously, the delays are around financial commitments in terms of can we run the scheme within the new financial year. So I completely understand the frustrations. Um, I have been raising this also in terms of uh, the financial commitments in the budget, um, because this is one of the critical areas as you start to look at recovery. Um, as a result of the pandemic as well. Obviously, there are current limitations on what we can do in engaging um, with the labour market and with young people entering because of the current restrictions, albeit we are hoping that those restrictions will start to ease um, in the coming months. And this is under constant review. I mean, it's an urgent area for me um, that I can get this programme up and running as soon as possible and when we have the resource committed in order to do that. So I will again update members um, as we're moving through. I mean, I appreciate you've communicated on this and I know other members have as well. Um, and we want to try and get this resolved as soon as possible. Ms Emma Sheeran. Priya Corleone, I want to join with others in welcoming the Minister back. I have... Uh, the honour of uh, being next door to Carol Nicollin upstairs. So when she was off, the biscuit supply w was affected. So I have a, a dual reason in, in welcoming you back. Minister, can you advise what type of jobs young people will be um, ad advised to, to enter in the Job Start Scheme? Well, I suppose the Job Start Scheme different um, in terms of what Kickstart is like. I mean, there's a greater flexibility in the scheme here and that a single job opportunity that arises um, that we can engage. I know that there's restrictions in terms of the uh, scheme across the water that a smaller employer would need at least 30 applications coming forward before that can be considered. So we are looking at, um, I mean, it's, a, it's across any area in terms of the employment sector um, that's out there. We do want to engage with young people to ensure that they are job ready to look at opportunities lasting up to six months where they can be placed um, in a work-based environment and then obviously working with job coaches and youth work coaches around supporting the young person and matching them to the job opportunities. So we're continuing to engage and there has been engagements ongoing with potential employers um, looking at potential placements. Um, and I hope that as soon as we can uh, go live with this scheme, um, that we can issue more details in terms of the type of uptake uh, that we're getting for the young people. Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Minister, can I wish you uh, all the best in your recovery too, and you're very welcome back here. Uh, Minister, you talked about, will there be any training for these young people in relation to the jobs that they're interested in and the people perhaps that will be employing them? There will be training and support, um, and obviously we're working with even our um, psychology um, experts within the department as well to look at barriers and limitations um, in terms of the young people that are coming forward. They will be assigned um, a support um, to them from the department in terms of working with them to ensure that they're job ready, to ensure the transition into potential six-month uh, placements. And we'll be working with them um, through those work coaches um, and their designed work coaches to deal specifically with young people um, and the issues and barriers pertaining to young people. Obviously, there are opportunities for young people to be employed with a minimum of 25 hours per week uh, for a six-month period, um, so, and training will be assigned to meet the young person's individual need um, as they're working through the initial application stage. Mr Paul Given. I welcome the Minister back to her place and, and wish her well. Uh, the, the job support scheme is an important one that we would like to see commenced. However, Equally important is to keep people currently in jobs. What efforts is the Minister making to make representation on behalf of sports clubs uh, that are being denied access to the localised restriction uh, support scheme that have hospitality, including bars, such as Ballymacash Rangers, which you visited, that currently are being deprived of that support and jeopardising their projects? Um, thanks to the member for their question. And obviously, um, this is an area that even within my own constituency has been raised. I know that it just doesn't relate to, uh, I suppose, social premises within sporting clubs. It goes into social clubs um, and that as well. And obviously, there are limitations. I have given support around sport and the grants that have been made available. I know that where there's a lost income pertaining from the social club end, that goes in to benefit the sport, that that can be picked up onto that sports programme, which the closing date is tomorrow. So obviously they encourage all members that if they have any sports organisations to ensure that they can get in for that grant. 
This is an issue that I've picked up. I mean, obviously, last year when the first lockdown um, had impacted, you know, sports clubs and social clubs were impacted even then. I had written to uh, the Minister of the Economy in terms of schemes there. In this scheme then, and obviously that you pointed around the Department of Finance, uh, we have raised this. Um, officials from both departments are looking at this to see what additional scheme. I obviously can't amend the existing sports scheme because it's a live application process at the moment. So we're working collectively now urgently. I mean, we've done a meeting last week. Um, at the end of last week, we're going to be re-engaging this week again to see if we can look at an additional measure um, in order to, to meet that need which is being expressed by members. Um, it obviously is a concern for people. Um, there is a concern you know, that their profit doesn't go into the pocket, private pockets of people. It's actually going to meet a broader social need as well in terms of how they reinvest that. Um, so we're looking to see if a scheme can be created and again we'll keep members um, updated on where that's sitting. The difficulty with the existing scheme that I'm told um, around the finance end is the rate and the rateable value. You know that some of these organisations, if you paid out on the rateable value for some that maybe operate a room, they would be getting paid more than some of our hotels. So obviously there is an issue of disparity there that we need to address. But I am conscious of there's a gap um, and we need to find a way as urgently as possible to meet the need and to fill that gap. So we can update members as we progress in those discussions and that will be coming to a conclusion over the next week or so because obviously we need something in place before the end of this financial year to support those uh, sports clubs but indeed social clubs as well. Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thanks very much for the question. And I suppose under the new decade, new approach deal committed uh, to a review of the future welfare mitigation measures to be taken forward. I'm currently finalising proposals for the review, and I plan to make a formal announcement on how it will uh, be taken forward in due course. Details of the review will be shared with the Committee for Communities at the earliest opportunity, and members will be afforded the chance to present their views on the proposal. I am not yet in a position to provide the specific details um, on issues that will be covered in the review. However, I can confirm that mitigation of the two-child policy uh, will be considered. That is part of the considerations. The overarching purpose uh, will be to identify the need to develop a prioritised mitigation package, which will be costed and assessed for affordability. I am committed to the principles of co-design and the desire to embed human rights in all that the Department does. And this will be an integral part in the development of any new mitigation measures. It is therefore planned to include representatives of the independent advice sector and other groups within the interest in social security at all stages. Obviously, we know from the 6th of April the, uh, 2017, the British government introduced a limit on the support of a maximum of two children. Families are not able to claim uh, a child element for the third subsequent born after the 6th of April. Um, and there are a number of exceptions to the two-child limit. Um, I do recognise that children living in poverty are subject to poor outcomes in terms of education, health and other opportunities. Um, and obviously I want to look at how we can close those gaps um, and to allow children to prosper and to participate fully uh, within society. There are a few things, um, I suppose, more important in terms of the well-being of children and young people. And as part of the review of welfare mitigations on the two-child policy, policy being considered, um, I want to bring forward those uh, new proposals as soon as possible. Ms Bradshaw. I'd like to welcome the Minister back as well. It's great to see you. Um, could you give us an, um, an update on the child poverty strategy, anti-poverty strategy? Obviously, we're a year on from the new decade, new approach. Thank you. Yeah, um, I covered this sorry, just in an earlier question. I know you might not have been. I wasn't sure if you're here or not. But obviously, there is a commitment in terms of having um, a draft paper ready for this December. Um, there had been delays at the start of last year because of the pandemic. But around all of the kind of social strategies, so the children's poverty, the anti-poverty strategy, um, we have um, engaged uh, a group. Um, of academics and experts that are obviously trying to bring together all of the information and data. We are engaging in a co-design panel from people who represent and have a voice in terms of dealing with these issues. Um, and we're going to be bringing forward uh, recommendations on next stages to the policy 
um, by December of this year, subject to executive approval. There are considerations, as was touched on, under the child poverty strategy and the expert panel that has been established for that, um, whether the, it needs a standalone policy or whether that can be knitted into the wider anti-poverty strategy. So obviously we're looking at those issues. I'll update the committee again and members as the expert panels on these two important strategies are coming forward with their work. Um, we obviously want to continue to engage the sector because there's lessons learned even as a result of the pandemic. Uh, one of the issues you know, raised around women and the impact of women and particularly children in the pandemic and how we can look at gender lens and gender proofing, for example, all of these strategies going forward. So I'm uh, keen and I'm going to be engaging with some of those key sectors, looking at the lessons of the pandemic and how that feeds into the poverty strategy work. And indeed, I'm sure the expert panel, because they're embedded in this work on a regular basis, uh, will be thinking of those issues as well in terms of lessons learned, that we don't lose anything um, with these strategies coming forward. But there is a commitment to get that done, to have that presented uh, by December of this year for that work to be completed. That concludes uh, the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And the first member on my list is Mr John Blair. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, yesterday, the Minister for Finance, in a budget statement, indicated that there could be an additional £17 million for housing, and this could lead to 1,900 new homes. Can I ask the Minister if she can confirm that this is the correct number and that that is in addition to existing targets or, or will supplement them? Well, obviously, we have uh, made a bid under the RRA borrowing in terms of our capital programme overall, of which housing is part of that. Um, and we do want to bring forward a housing programme, just over 1,900 homes uh, for the incoming financial year. Um, it will be the biggest programme that has been done, um, certainly in recent years as well. And obviously, longer term, I'm looking to build the capacity. I mean, we need to be building more social homes. Just in the first six months of the pandemic, uh, there were 2,000 additional people who presented with housing stress. Normally, we don't reach those figures. It takes two years normally to reach those figures, and the pandemic has definitely increased the pressure around that. So I do want to look at ways that I can increase uh, the social housing build programme, obviously putting more investment into co-ownership and other types of housing choices as well. Um, but obviously, the budget is out for consultation at the moment. That has to come back to the executive to be signed off once I know the definite figure um, in terms of that borrowing and the overall budget allocation for the department, I can give more clarity. Mr Blair, for a supplementary. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. And thank the Minister for that reply. Can I ask uh, further to that if the Minister can confirm where these new homes will be built and if she can ensure that rural need for social housing in constituencies such as mine will be addressed? Yeah, well, there's the social housing development programme, um, which is obviously in the public domain as well in terms of looking at where the housing need is. There is a big pressure, um, particularly in areas of highest housing need. We're not building enough homes in those areas. And obviously that's something I know that uh, Carl, when she was in post, wanted to look at that issue. And it's something that I have raised when I was initially in the department last year. Um, so there is a programme there. I mean, I can get you forward you the, the specific detail in terms of the proposals and where the homes are ready in this financial year. But we are looking at um, areas and how we can potentially ring fence or look at a focus in those areas of greatest housing need. I'm also committed um, in terms of looking at rural proofing um, and identifying that there are disparities, but there are unique challenges for rural communities and particularly around accessing or maintaining. Um, a home as well, and indeed that's something that I have asked staff to look at in more detail. Um, and again, I can engage with you um, on those specific areas. But I do want to ensure that we do have a more ambitious social housing building program to build the infrastructure and the capacity. That's part of obviously the housing transformation and revitalisation piece that was brought forward in the November statement uh, by Carl. Um, and I'll update members as we're moving through that. But if there are specific issues. Um, or queries that you have, um, then we can follow up um, after this. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I may wish the, the Minister a better 2021 than 2020. 
Um, as, as a minister responsible for sport, could you update us on the Sports Sustainability Fund, well, which I believe closes tomorrow? Yeah, well, just obviously that fund was launched um, just before Christmas. Uh, the money was committed, obviously, in terms of COVID response. As you say, the application is open live at the moment, um, and I would encourage any sports organisation um, to apply for that fund, which is closing tomorrow. We are obviously hoping to do an assessment, a quick turnaround of applications, and to see what the demand is. I know um, Member Gervin raised an issue pertaining to uh, social you know, entities around um, alcohol and the impact of the loss of sales has on some sports. Um, and some of those areas can be picked up within the existing fund if they can prove that the lost income has had an impact on the sport itself. And obviously, I'm working with DOF to look at what other measures we can put in place. But uh, we are obviously working. I mean, I know that there will be a huge demand for this. We know when we put out the initial hardship fund of two million, there was a huge demand which was being shown. So again, I want to continue to engage with Sport NI and with the sports um, organisations and codes themselves, um, that if it is oversubscribed, are there other things that we can be doing? But again, just it's a live application at the minute. The closing date is tomorrow. And encourage um, organisations out there, or members indeed in this room, to get the applications in um, before close of play. Mr Nesbitt. I'm, I'm aware that the fund, I believe, is £25 million, And as chair of the all-party group on sport, I've been warned that if the big three, the GAA, IFA and Ulster Branch, the Rugby Union, put in big bids. There could be less than 10 million left for everybody else. So could I ask the Minister if she might commit to two things? Firstly, to, to lobbying the Finance Minister for some of the 126.9 million of COVID mitigation that he said is being held back, uh, and that was in his announcement on the budget yesterday. Uh, and secondly, to lobby for, for sports clubs to be included in the localised restrictions support scheme. Yeah, no, thanks very much. And obviously, we're keeping all of these issues, be it sport, culture, and arts, um, looking at the initial community COVID response under review. There is an issue in terms of capacity and for the money to get out um, in the time that we need to spend it. Obviously, it is a live process at the minute. The closing date is tomorrow. A close of play, we'll know in terms of how many applications are in and over the coming weeks what the budget is going to look like. I have been in engagement uh, with DOF and obviously with officials and with Sport NI and others around are there additional pressures um, and what in monetary terms does that look like in order to allow us to draw up and to make a bid. The important thing is, is getting certainty um, from arm's length bodies that if the money is there, are we able to ensure that the money can be spent in time? And obviously there are specific challenges around that in terms of capacity and um, because these organisations you know, nobody could have foreseen um, this pandemic, um, but it is under constant review. I'm currently looking at it at the moment. We'll know by close of play tomorrow. The other issue I covered, I'm not sure if you were in, in terms of, um, I've identified, obviously we know that there's a gap in terms of social clubs linked to sporting organisations um, and indeed social clubs more broadly. Um, the current um, scheme around rates um, from some of the engagement, I mean, they're saying that there would be a huge disparity because it's down to the building in which the club is situated. Some of these clubs, maybe the drinking part is one room, but their rateable value is for the entire site. So therefore, you know, a, a bar of one room could be getting more than a hotel, for example. So that would cause a huge disparity and imbalance. We're trying to see if there is in the time scale to allow in this financial year can we look at what else we can be doing? Um, obviously, I couldn't amend the existing sporting scheme because it's live for applications. I couldn't amend that in the midst of applications. So my officials and officials within DOF are proactively working at the minute to see if we can find a solution and a way forward to meet the needs um, of these clubs that are affiliated to sports, but also social clubs more widely. Mr. Cahill Boylan. And Corley and I welcome the Minister back. I could ask the Minister, would the Minister join with me in sending the support of this Assembly to the management and staff of the Belfast Multicultural Association and ask her what support can be provided? Yeah, no, thanks very much for your question. And obviously, I mean, it was devastating um, the news that came through last week um, of the fire that took place in not just a beautiful historic building, 
but in terms of the work and the vital work in the midst of a pandemic um, that the Belfast Multicultural Association are doing. Obviously, I attended the scene on Friday and spoke to members of the association just in terms of giving my support um, and what I could be doing. And obviously, there was fear at that point. We didn't know. Uh, the police hadn't confirmed that it was a hate crime, and that came through later in the evening. I have liaised over the weekend with members of the association, and I held a meeting yesterday um, just by Zoom um, in terms of the association, but also groups that are affiliated, um, because with this attack, there's obviously been a rise in fears um, within the community. Um, and this isn't just pertaining to now. See, there's been a building um, of events. There had been previous attacks. Um, and there is a concern um, and a feeling of anger and frustration um, amongst the association, but also minority ethnic communities um, more generally. Um, and also, you know, were all of the protections put in place um, or was, were, were there gaps? Um, from that, I have obviously committed. I know the officials within my department were working with Belfast City Council. The first uh, part of intervention, we want to make sure that there's temporary accommodation because they're delivering essential food and other supports to communities and families that need it. I know they were operating that at the weekend from their homes, and that's not sustainable. So we're looking at current locations. I mean, I know last night Belfast City Council were offering the Waterfront Hall. I know other voluntary organisations have come forward to the department with support for buildings to get them in on a temporary basis. We're obviously working through the food programme that the department is supporting uh, with Belfast Council in this instance, um, that we can obviously get food and access to food to those families as soon as possible. The longer term then is obviously getting the organisation back into the building, and I think that was one of the big things, um, that there is a support from this assembly and from others that we want them back in that building again, uh, we want the building opened again, and for them to deliver more services than what they are now. And I know there's an aspiration and an ambition from the project to do that. Um, so I'm going to be engaging with them again on a regular basis. Obviously, there are issues pertaining to the executive office as well um, in terms of race relations and indeed with the Department of Justice around security issues, around protection, around concerns that they have raised. So I'll be engaging proactively uh, with ministers um, in the coming days and weeks on that as well. Thank you. Before I call Mr Borland for a supplementary, um, it's at the discretion of a minister if they wish to go over two minutes in an answer, but they should let me know. But given the importance of the subject, I was loath to interrupt the minister in, in the answer that she was giving, because I think it was important that the House was informed. Mr Borland. I'm going to get to the previous concurrent colleague. Thank the minister for a comprehensive answer, but will the minister commit to be, being, uh, keep the proactive engagement going? And also to work with the relevant authorities to ensure that we get the message out there that this behaviour is not going to be intol tolerated within our society. For a minimum. Yeah, I think quickly. I mean, racism cannot be tolerated and it has to be faced down. I think that was one of the areas um, that members of the association and the wider community want to see more of in terms of that visible uh, support uh, for them out on the ground when incidents like this happen. And I think that needs to be the case whether it's racism or sectarianism. Uh, wherever it raises its ugly head. Um, I will be continuing to support them through the department where I can, um, and obviously looking at uh, the wider community and what else can be done um, in terms of this. And the big thing is to ensure that we can get the organisation back into their existing building as soon as possible. So I'm committed to doing that. Mr Alex Easton. Principal Deputy Speaker, and welcome the Minister back. Um, Minister, um, why are people who are on more pension mobility supplements not entitled to the COVID-19 heating payment, and how does she plan to address that? Yeah, I know this is a live issue at the minute, and obviously Carl was in position when it came forward, um, and her main motivation was to try and get additional support to people that needed it, recognising that fuel poverty was a growing issue in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and I'm glad that the committee agreed with that in terms of the corresponding benefits um, that are being picked up. I know this issue had been raised, obviously, by Andy and others in the committee as well. And I recognise that um, the system is in place working with the uh, Department of Work and Pensions in terms of that payment being released um, as soon as possible. And obviously, the issue around the corresponding benefit, I am proactively looking at how we can ensure that we close that gap. 
and are there any other correspondent benefits that have been missed? Um, my, I mean, I want to get as much support and payments out to people as I possibly can, um, and particularly during this pandemic. So it is recognised that it was a gap um, that was there. It's obviously been highlighted, and to thank the members who have highlighted that issue. We're obviously trying to find ways, um, working with DWP and with key stakeholders as to how that can be paid. I know for this specific benefit, it's around 800 um, individuals or people. Um, so we're trying to find a way um, with the system to have that paid as soon as possible. And once we have clarity on that, we'll obviously bring that back to the committee as well. But there is a commitment definitely to, to address it. I'm afraid that's uh, time up. Um, this, the, the minister it does resemble, it's like Jeff boycotted at the crease, just slow and steady. But anyway, um, I thank the minister and again welcome her back. Um, we'll be returning to the